Hello, welcome and welcome back to my channel. Um, I had quite the influx of subscribers this week, um, so thank you very much for everyone finding my channel. I suspect that most of you have come from the way of uh, Michael K. Vaughan, who very kindly shouted me out on his uh, booktubers I love tag, which was very kind of him, and thank you very much, Michael. Um, and there's probably a few of you from other channels too. Uh, I think uh, Daniel from Guilty Feet has definitely mentioned me a couple times, and, the, and there's probably a, maybe a couple of other channels. So however you found me anyway, it's, it's very nice to have new subscribers and it's real, very, very, always very nice to have uh, all of you uh, returning viewers too. Uh, I don't always know why you'd want to watch uh, me talking about uh, kind of trashy crime novels from the 1950s that you probably never heard of, but uh, that's kind of what I do, so uh, yeah. Um, sorry, I'm <laughs> taking you to sit in this chair. Um, but. Um, I try to I diversify a little bit too, and uh, this month's a very good month for that because there's New World's November, which is focusing on science fiction short stories, and there's Non-Fiction November, which is obviously focusing on non-fiction, and there's also a Dinjathon, which is focusing on indigenous uh, books and, and stories. Um, so I'm trying to uh, token read around that because I also have the usual crime novels to read. But then anyway, um, I'll try and keep this quick because I tried to do a uh, upload a tag video I did on Tuesday and it just would not load. So I've kind of um, been a little shy to make any more videos since uh, in case they wouldn't upload. But uh, I thought I'd do a, a Friday Reads, albeit a little bit late, and see how I go. So hopefully you will all see this. Um, so the first thing I read this week was Empire State, Empire Star, sorry, by uh, Samuel R. Delaney. It's a very weird little science fiction novella, about 100 pages long. Uh, I think Samuel R. Delaney went on in the 70s to write about, kind of write more like uh, queer science fiction stories. Um, this one was from 1966, and it's definitely still about identity. Um, it has a little bit of a, a racial theme that involves slavery and, and, and things like that. Um, it's very, very hard to explain this no novel but, um, and I probably think I'll have to reread it at some point uh, in the not too, dear, not too um, distant future. But um, basically our protagonist is on a planet that is basically just um, mines one thing and everyone just leads a really simple life and a, um, a spaceship crash lands with some people um, and a, a weird life form that kind of can crystallize but still be alive and they, um, they crash land with a message but um, no one actually knows what, no one's actually able to tell our protagonist, who I think is called Comet Joe, um, no one's actually able to tell our protagonist what the message is. Um, but he's still determined to deliver it, and it's kind of assumed that once he gets to Empire Star, which is where kind of the, um, where all the, the power structure is in this, uh, in this world, galaxy, whatever, um, he will know what the message is and it's all kind of about destiny and, and the time being right and then but they've also got where there's different people, there's simplex people, there's complex people and then there's multiplex people and simplex people basically can just live very simple lives and don't ask questions and then there's complex people who are much more complex and simplex and kind of can think more for themselves but, and they'll ask questions but they'll kind of ask very basic questions whereas the multiplexes are very mul very uh, very uh, clever and, and will be able to see things from multiple different views and will ask 
kind of more esoteric questions. They won't, ask the, won't necessarily ask the most obvious questions. And it's all very, it, it's, it gets all, it's all, it, it, what, it appears to be a very basic story up until a point and then it gets very kind of complicated and convoluted and esoteric and it's very and it, it's actually really really clever but it, it's one of those stories you kind of have to then go back to kind of see how it was all done um even though it is very well explained at the end um definitely i, I didn't feel like a complete like I didn't know what was going on, I didn't know it, but it, it's good to go back and read it to, with the knowledge of how it ends to kind of see how each piece was put into place. It's, it's, it's very impressive, actually. I think I definitely will be seeking out uh, Samuel Adelaney again to read some more of his uh, um, novels. So that was that, and then uh, from then I was. Uh, Looking at my good reads and realized that I had only read two Agatha Christie's so far and I had committed myself to reading all of, at least all of Agatha Christie's novels, I think. Um, it gets a bit more complicated when you get into the short stories and the short story compilations, especially with uh, the British publications, American publications being slightly different. So I think I worked out that it was 67 novels because there was one that was there was one that was posthumously um, released in, I think, 2014 or something. Um, that was uh, previously, it was as released based on a previous manuscript. But I believe that um, that, that book, that, that novel was um, actually reworked into, uh, was it Dead Man's Folly or something? Earlier on, so I'm kind of not really including that uh, novel from 2014, uh, post posthumous. Um, so I think it was 67 novels I worked out that I have to read. Um, so I've read two, um, so that would make it 65. And then I thought, if I read another one, that's 64. Um, and then if I read at least one a month, <laughs> that's going to be five years until I finish. So yeah, I think I better get on. Um, so yeah, I read another Agatha Christie and I literally just have a whole shelf of the top, the top shelf is just Agatha Christie. I got, I got it on eBay a lot that I, that I uh, bought. It was pretty cheap from America. And I, yeah, I just got a whole load of them. I think it's the, the pocketbook versions from that was released in America in like the 60s and 70s, I think. Um, so yeah, I just, I just go over and grab one at random. So um, this one I read was Easy to Kill, uh, otherwise known as Murder is Easy. This is from, nine, originally published in 1938. And um, it was okay, it was okay. I, I figured out pretty early on who the murderer was. Um, the, the trouble with Agatha Christie, and I, I, like, I haven't read much of Agatha Christie, um, but I have seen all the adaptations pretty much. My mum was a huge Agatha Christie fan. It's probably um, has probably read most of them. I've definitely seen all of the <laughs> adaptations multiple times. Um, the only adaptations I haven't really seen are the modern ones um, from the last whatever uh, ten years or so. Um, but I've seen all the all the classics um, and kind of you kind of kind of was quite formulaic and it's still good they're still good to read um but it usually it's most often than not it's the most unlikely person is actually the killer and so i actually figured this one out pretty pretty quickly um it's usually someone that agatha christie is leading you away from or um someone that is kind of just not even really, it's kind of there, but never really um, thought of as a killer. That's usually who it is. And that's basically figured it out pretty early on. Um, and our protagonist, uh, our, our uh, policeman is, our ex-policeman actually, he was a policeman in, in India and he's retired and he's just, he literally just got back to England and he stumbled upon 
not one murder, not two, but I think it's like six people or something <laughs> have been murdered in this, this small, um, this small commuter village just outside London. Um, but anyway, here, Luke Fitzwilliam, he's not a very, he's not the greatest, uh, he's not the greatest detective. He's a little bit uh, slow on the uptake, as it were, and uh, he also has a really bad um, cover story for coming to coming to the village. Um, it's quite this, this the start of it is very happenstance. Uh, he gets he's he's come back to England. He's got off the ferry, got on the train that leads into London. He got off the train at this random stop. Um, grabs a paper, goes back to get on his train. It's not there. And he's like, where's the train? And the, the porter's like, the train doesn't stop. Well, like, what train? Like, the, and he's like, this, this ferry train, he's like, it doesn't stop here. And he's like, well, it did. And then the porter guy, uh, well, it's not supposed to. It was probably just a red light. <laughs> it's probably just a signal stop. And yeah, the guy got off and missed the train. So he grabs on the next train and it happens to have this old woman, uh, Lavernia, or Lavinia Fullerton, who tells us, him this story about how she believes that a bunch of people in her little village have been murdered. And she's now on her way to Scotland Yard to um, tell uh, the London police because she doesn't believe that the local police will do anything or uh, will listen to her. Um, and she also tells him the name of the next victim and he thinks nothing of it and then the next day reads in the paper that she's been involved in a car accident and he's like oh that's uh, that's strange that she was in a car accident I was just talking to him on the train and then I think the next day the person she says was going to be the next victim ends up dying and he's like okay now that's too much of a coincidence I'm gonna go check this out and just so happens that the person he's staying with has a cousin that lives in the village that the murders took place and so his cover story is that he's going to visit this, his friend's cousin saying that he's another cousin and that he's going to write a story, write a book about uh, superstition because this town has a lot of uh, superstition still like medieval kind of superstition and pa pagan rituals still going on apparently and he knows nothing <laughs> about the subject matter so it's kind of a ridiculous cult story and yeah he like snoops around and yeah it was okay. It wasn't great. It was okay. Um, it was. It had some enjoyable lines. You, the more you realize Agatha Christie, the more you realize she really didn't like people. Very caught up. I mean, it's. She wrote what nineteen twenties to the nineteen fifth. Uh, what seventies? But um, the, definitely the earliest stuff, nineteen twenties to like pre World War Two. Definitely caught up in the kind of class politics of the day, and so she very much. Um, very much uh, seems to favor aristocracy and, and hated the nouveau riche and hated anyone that was well probably hated the nouveau riche more than the working class but looked very down upon the working class kind of mainly why I uh, have avoided reading her most of my life but uh, they're still pretty fun to read um, but there is one little um, little segment that is just just brilliant that I want to read to you um so they're talking about um someone that had visited a uh science laboratory and um <clears throat> it's like so it, te it tests out drugs and, drugs and uh, poisons and what's not so they have to use animals so a character uh starts up a conversation, or continues the conversation. Mrs. Anstruth, a moment. They use guinea pigs, I believe, so cruel, though of course not so bad as dogs or even cats. Fellows who use dogs ought to be shot, said Major Horton hoarsely. I really believe, Horton, said Mr. Abbott, that you value canine life above human life. 
every time that the major dogs can't turn around on you like human beings can never get a nasty word from a dog only a nasty tooth stuck into your leg said mr abbott what about that a, a. orton dogs are a good judge of character said major orton one of your brutes nearly pinned me by the leg last week what do you say to that horton same as i just same as i said just now <laughs> uh, it's just it's just perfectly uh it's just a perfect little kind of taste of a Agatha Christie's kind of wicked sense of humor and, and B kind of how she kind of despises people and probably wanted to be fairly left in all, I imagine. Um, maybe not as misanthropic as um, uh, Patricia Highsmith, but uh, definitely was probably particular with her company. Anyway, so that was that. Um, on to reading for uh, this week. Um, I did say, say uh, I was going to token read around um, non-fiction November and Indigenous-thon, and this actual is classifies as both. This is um, Call Me Indian. Um, this is the, I don't know how to believe it's the autobiography. Yeah, the autobiography of uh, Fred Sasakamus, who was, who actually sadly died at the start of this year, I think just before his uh, book came out um but he, he was the first um first indigenous canadian uh, at least treaty in what do they how do they describe it in treaty indigenous um yeah uh nhl's first treaty indigenous player yeah so he's the first uh first treaty indigenous player to play in the nhl uh, he's made his debut in 1954. He is from, um, I believe he's from somewhere out west in Canada. Um, but um, he went, when he was at age of seven, he was torn from his home and, and sent off to the residential schools. Um, and went through that horrific ordeal for 10 years. And then um, he made the NHL made his debut in 1954 as the first indigenous player um, playing for the Chicago Blackhawks, which in itself playing for a, a team named after, um, named, uh, I haven't got a Native American name, is probably quite traumatic, um, especially back in those days when players were really, um, were really seen as, as um, being owned by the team. That was very, very, little in the way of players rights that uh, we have nowadays um and so yeah he played ended up playing 12 games played alongside or played against um such legends as like gordy helm or maurice richard and i think truly deserved his place there i think at that time there was only about 120 players that played in the nhl um so yeah very much deserved and then he played 12 games and then went back home to kind of reconnect with um his land and his and his family and his people that he was so disgustingly ripped apart from and i think he continued to play in uh, various hockey leagues in western canada and and, and just really became a, a, a very awesome community leader so yeah I'm very interested to read this this kind of touches on some very important subjects especially now in Canada where it has been a real realization of the legacy of the residential schools and uh, I don't know um, that uh, Fred Sasakamuth was very much an inspiration and and really helped break through the causes of, of um, indigenous players in the NHL but such people like uh, Jordan Tattoo later on really uh, reaped the benefits of and I think this is just it's just going to be a great uh, story of someone overcoming ordeals and, and um, really uh, then also just giving back as well. So yeah, I'm very interested, very excited to read that and I'll probably get a, a go this week um, if I can. Otherwise, I'll, I'll get to it this month. Um, <coughs> and other than that, I there's... Um, I, I had a real breakthrough. I've been using Libby for um, ebook uh, ebooks from the library, but that but the what happens here is so Libby is 
um, for the basically in, for entire Ontario. It's the one library system for Libby. Um, it's like called like the Ontario Consortium Library. Um, but then I realized that my own local library has uh, ebook sharing through Hoopla, and they actually have a lot. They actually have uh, different books, and they actually have a few books that. Um, I wanted to read that Libby doesn't have, so that's quite exciting. Um, so one of those was um, a Gideon Defoe book about, I can't remember the name of the title right now, but it's Gideon Defoe, the guy that wrote the um, Pirates series, so like Pirates in an Adventure with uh, Scientists and so, so far, so all that series, if you're familiar with that. Um, so it's a non-fiction book about um, countries that failed, basically, and uh, and he, he, he's a he's a humorous writer, so I think it's it's going to be a slightly on the, the funny side, but it's also it's not it's based on it's actually nonfiction. Um, so I'm very interested to read that. So I've got that on Hoopla, so I'll hopefully read that too. Um, and then other than that, um, sorry, I should I really got stuff saying oh, I'm all the time. So uh, Janelle at Too Fond of Books is reading the Philo Vance series by S.S. Van Dyne, and uh, I was very, I was very uh, shocked to see that people were interested in reading S.S. Van Dyne uh, re uh, in these days, this day and age. Um, I said that uh, I think I thought that only me and uh, Steve Donahue were possibly the only people that have actually read S.S. Van Dyne on Booktube. <coughs> so I was, uh, I was chuckling my way and then I actually came across, um, a multi-pack of S.S. Van Dyne novels on the, on the Libby app. And so I, I'm going to join in, uh, reading at least the first one with them. Um, and if you don't know anything about S.S. Van Dyne, he was basically this, uh, pompous, I don't know if he was even very good, but he was a pompous art critic um, that uh, apparently during rehabil rehabilitation for an accident that he had, uh, spent like a year in bed. And whilst he was bedridden, he uh, wrote, he read a ton of corrupt crime novels. I guess he just wanted, I guess he just thought he wanted something kind of light and easy to read. And he just basically got obsessed with crime novels, mystery novels, and then he was like, these are so easy to write. I can just I can just write my own, and so he did. <coughs> but they were kind of crappy novels, and um, the, the and the, one of the reasons I really laugh is is basically that um, Raymond Chandler called Philo Vance the probably the most asinine character in ever in crime fiction, and he is kind of pretty annoying. I've read I've read one, I've read at least one. Um, previously, I can't remember the name of the title, but it was pretty, it was pretty bad, but it was pretty funny bad as well, so I'm, I'm happy to read these again, and really, it'd be interesting to see them, read them as a group, uh, as a group too, um, to see how other people are, uh, are getting along with them too, uh, yeah, that'd be fun, um, and then other than that, I don't think I have much, um, I have been watching a few old movies, I love uh, old movies, especially like film noir, I love black and white movies, and <coughs> I've been watching a few of those recently, and the one that I watched in the past few days uh, was Somewhere in the Night, uh, starring the great John Hodiak, who sadly I think kind of died in the 50s, probably quite young, and so he's, he's really not a household name nowadays. Um, he kind of has the, the, the kind of Vincent Price kind of style of look to him with like the, you know, the trimmed moustache. Um, he doesn't quite have the um, quite amazing accent that Vincent Price has, but it, it's somewhere in that kind of mid-Atlantic, East Coast uh, uh, region. It, it's, it's quite similar. Um, but he's a very good actor. Somewhere in the night, it, I, I don't think it's necessarily critically acclaimed, but I love it. I've seen it at least 10 times. I actually have it on DVD, but um, the problem is I have all my DVDs in, in, a, in, in a 
packages and, it, and it can be a bit annoying finding them but I also actually don't have a working DVD player right now as well and they're all UK DVDs so I would also need a multi-region DVD player um, so yeah that's my uh, since my computer broke um, and I haven't fixed it I have, don't have access to a working DVD player so um, most of the times I watch my uh, videos on YouTube so yeah, Somewhere in the Night, it's great. It's one one of the film noirs that particularly is dealing with the uh, returned soldiers. Uh, returning soldiers from World War II and PTSD. And just kind of the general disaffe disaffection the soldiers um, felt coming back from the war and, and back into society. So it's actually, it's, but it's also a crime thriller. It's very interesting. It's a very great film, very interesting really well acted um i can't remember who else is in it but it's very good it's very good and and it's also one of those movies that it's it's based around kind of identity and so they actually mention this one name like something like 800 times in the whole movie <laughs> so it's it's quite uh, it's quite funny and you'll that name will just get lodged into your head um but yeah i think that's it i think hopefully i'll i've just found a couple more youtube channels that show some great old movies that I never have seen, never, probably never even heard of. So that's the great thing about the uh, the film noir, they didn't last long but they made a hell of a lot of movies, um, similar to crime novels, just wrote a lot of novels you'll never, you'll never uh, be for one for watching or reading, <clears throat> and then if you, if you do run out you just watch them all over again, so yeah, that was me. I hope you have a good reading week. Um, this was a bit longer than I wanted it to be, but we'll uh, hopefully, it, fingers crossed, that it loads up. And I guess if you're seeing this, then it did. So, congratulations to you <laughs> or me, whatever. Um, but yeah, thank you again for all uh, watching, and I'll see you again soon. Bye.